I'm Anita Sherman. I'm editor of the Culpeper Times, and the Culpeper Times has partnered with Culpeper Media Network, um, which is located at 105 North Main Street in Culpeper, for a series that they are launching on um, veteran interviews. So today in our studio we have Al Aiken, who uh, we're going to be chatting with today. And today is Thursday, October 27th. Welcome, Al. Hello, Anita. How Hi, it's good to have you with us. Thanks. All right, very good. Okay, what we want to do with this discussion of your military background is kind of start at the beginning. Um, what state you were born, a little bit about your parents, if your father was uh, in military or siblings in military. So we'll kind of uh, start at the beginning. I was born in 1948 on Valentine's Day. Oh right? my gosh, <laughs> I'll have to remember that. Uh, in Oakland, California, up in the Bay Area. My father was in the uh, U.S. Navy at the time, had been for quite a while, had been in the Navy during World War II and uh, after I was born uh, again during Korea. And uh, that's where I got my pension for flying. Uh, because he was stationed aboard aircraft carriers. He was mm -hmm. a, uh, a Navy chief, and then later, before he retired, uh, he had become a senior chief, and he worked on airplanes, uh, power plants specifically, big radial mm -hmm. engines. Uh, and e every time the aircraft carrier was either coming into, uh, back from deployment, or going out on deployment, they had a big open house, and the whole family would come, and we get to walk all over the flight deck, see all the airplanes and I, I, I remember since So you I had was, an early introduction oh, to Oh, three this. years old. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so I got to climb around airplanes uh, since then and so therefore I always wanted to fly. So at what point did you, uh, how old were you when you went into the service? Well, uh, I got my commission as a second lieutenant in the Marines, uh, also my diploma from Cal Poly mm -hmm. with a degree in aeronautical engineering. Uh, and my orders to uh, the Navy Flight School um, all on June 6th, 1970. So that would have made me 22 years old. So 22 years old on June 6th, so kind of a, a D-Day anniversary as well. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, I know. Much. Well, right. I was, uh, that's true. All right, so once you did that, then w tell us a little bit about your experiences with that process and your training? Uh, well, I went, I was thankful enough. I had wanted to be in the Navy because, of course, that's what my dad was in. So mm -hmm. I wanted to fly uh, jets uh, from U.S. aircraft carriers. So I thought the Navy was the way to go. But one day I was walking through the snack bar uh, in, on campus at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, California, and the Marines were in there recruiting. And they had a big, huge billboard with a picture of an F-4 Phantom, uh, which is an airplane that I thought was just mm -hmm. awesome, uh, with two Marine pilots standing out in front of it in what looked like spacesuits. And they had like uh, fishbowl helmets, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, astronauts would have and stuff. And I looked at that and I started drooling and I was a little bit of a egotist anyways. And so I thought, well, no. I, I, I'd like to be really cool <laughs> like that too. So uh, I signed up, uh, and as it turned out, the Marines had a little bit better program uh, than the Navy did. If I did it, everything I was supposed to do for the Navy, uh, they would let me join the Navy, but then they would decide whether I was going to fly airplanes or be on a submarine or whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. But the Marine Corps said, if you uh, do everything that you're supposed to do, keep your grades up and graduate and so forth, we guarantee you that we'll send you to flight school. So uh, I joined the Marines and I went to And that was school. okay with dad? Well, uh, that was uh, kind of a funny thing because, uh, you know, he's, he was a 20 year, 20 some odd year career Navy man uh, and a chief to boot. And, you know, there's always this friendly competition between the Navy guys sure. and the Marines. And so I called them up from college and I said, Dad, I uh, just joined the Marines. And there was a very long period of silence. <laughs> and they... He said, uh, okay, and that was it. 
So now, so you're still in California now for your training and whatnot. Did that stay in California? Where did that take you? The training was out here in Quantico, Virginia. Okay. okay. It was called the Platoon Leaders Class, parentheses A, A standing for aviation. Mm -hmm. So my job was to go to a six-week training period here in Quantico from California. They flew me out here. They beat me up for six weeks, and then they sent me back. And then two summers later, I went for a second six-week training period where they beat me up some more. And then when I finished that and went back to school, I had all the criteria completed. All I needed to do was graduate from school, and I would be commissioned a second lieutenant. And that's what happened on June 6th, 1970. 1970, 1970. So the, the whole Vietnam War is, is going on at this time. How did that factor in, or did it? Uh, it, well, it factored in... I mean, in terms of you, where you were with... To some degree. I mean, I followed what was happening, particularly the air war mm -hmm. uh, in Vietnam. Uh, I kept up on the statistics, how many planes uh, we lost and uh, how many victories we had. Primarily the air war, because uh, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted mm -hmm. to fly. And so I expected that I would... Um, get my commission in the Marine Corps, I'd go to flight school, I'd get my wings, and then I'd go fight in Vietnam with the Marines, just like everybody else. Uh, but in 1970, the uh, Vietnam War was just beginning to taper off. Y yes. Mm -hmm. All right, and so I went to flight school, it was a year and a half. Uh, I can tell you lots about that in a few minutes if you want. Um, I no, got I'm my... I don't, want, I don't want to interrupt you, but I do want to kind of uh, hear about that those experiences in your training and what was involved with that. All right, um, I'll, I'll just uh, finish this one little train yes. of thought. Uh, I got my wings in November of uh, 1971, and then I had a month off, and they sent me to my first duty station, which was Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii, oh. Marine Corps Air Station. Oh. Well, that, <laughs> Gee, what tough duty. <laughs> tough duty, it was really, but, uh, it, and there's some downsides to being in Hawaii for an extended period of time. We weren't, uh, uh, that the three squadrons that were based in Hawaii were not involved in the Vietnam War at that particular moment in time. And then, in, uh, so I joined my first squadron, which was VMFA uh, 212, uh, an F-4 Phantom squadron, and uh, I was assigned to maintenance. So I was one of the maintenance officers. I was in charge of the, uh, uh, aircraft metal shop, okay? So I had maybe 20 or 30 Marines that uh, I was now in charge of as a brand new second lieutenant. I didn't know anything, they knew everything. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I started flying the Phantom and uh, that uh, I joined the squadron actually in February of 72, because remember I got my wings in November and then mm -hmm. with leave and then travel out there and so forth. So in February of 72, I joined the squadron uh, and then in April of 1972, the uh, Tet Offensive flared up in Vietnam, and they needed one of our squadrons to go in and help suppress uh, the enemy uh, aggression against South mm -hmm. Vietnam. And the squadron that I was in was called into Da Nang, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But I only had like eight hours so far of flight time in the airplane uh, that I, everybody was flying, the F-4 Phantom. Uh, so the six or seven of us that were in the squadron, brand new, and they called us Nuggets, new guys. New guys. New guys. Okay. Nugget means a new guy. A yeah. new guy. A All new, right. inexperienced guy. And I had even dropped my first bomb off of the F-4 Phantom yet. I had a little bit of training on that in the training command, uh, but I hadn't done it in the F-4 yet. And so uh, the Marine Corps was worried about us new guys possibly dropping bombs on the wrong people, like the, like the friendlies, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so we were not allowed to go with the squadron. So they put the six or seven of us over in one of the sister squadrons, which turned out to be VMFA 235. Mm -hmm. uh, and they um, uh, brought several of the experienced guys that had already had one or two tours in Vietnam, so they knew what they were doing. And they brought those over into VMFA 212. 
And then I went to the squadron one Saturday morning and helped box everything up and then said goodbye to my squadron as they went for, uh, launched for uh, Da Nang, Vietnam. And I went over to the sister squadron and I continued to train there. Now, I'm just curious, did that squadron, did those uh, men return? The squadron returned four months later, having lost two airplanes to mm -hmm. enemy fire uh, and three of our crew members. Uh, the uh, pilot from one of the airplanes and both the pilot and the Rio. I say Rio, that's, that stands for Radar Intercept Officer. That's the uh, Naval Flight Officer as distinguished from a pilot, a mm -hmm. Naval Aviator. Uh, the Naval Flight Officer, the Rio, sat in the back seat of the F-4 Phantom and his job was to manage the radar. Because the F-4 Phantom was originally designed to be a high altitude interceptor to go after mm -hmm. enemy bombers that might be coming at the United States. Uh, as it turns out, we had the war in Vietnam and it turned out to be a dogfighter <laughs> instead of a high altitude interceptor, but and it actually, and a bomber, it was a bomber there too. Uh, and it, it was a fabulous airplane, it worked out very well in that role. So what, tell me a little bit now, uh, going back to some of the training, um, when you're flying one of those, are you by yourself there as a pilot? Do you have a copilot? What's the physical setup inside that plane? Well, in the uh, operational F-4 Phantom, it's a two-seat airplane. There's one pilot and one naval flight officer who we call the Rio, the radar mm -hmm. intercept mm -hmm. officer. Uh, it's not like commercial airlines where you have a pilot and a co-pilot, maybe a flight engineer mm -hmm. and a crew of flight attendants. It's nothing like that at all. It's uh, pretty much a single seat. Mm -hmm. So the pilot's responsible for the airplane, the safe operation of the airplane. And, uh, but you're trained to do that uh, through that year and a half of uh, naval mm -hmm. flight training. And the naval flight training starts out in Pensacola, Florida. Okay, still to this day, it does. The first airplane I flew for uh, training was the T-34 Mentor. It was built by Beechcraft uh, Aircraft Company. Uh, it had a 470 horsepower uh, engine, and that's where we just began learning to fly. Uh, to how to take off, how to land, how to get from one point to another by just looking at the ground. We didn't do too much uh, instrument navigation in those days, or in the early part. Uh, and we would learn aerodynamics and a lot of other uh, naval uh, aerodynamics uh, and engine propulsion and things like that. Uh, once we graduated from flying that uh, primary airplane, then we went to basic jet training up in Meridian, Mississippi. Okay, they had a naval base up in Meridian, Mississippi. Well, you think, well, why would they have a Navy base <laughs> way know. inland in Meridian, Mississippi, <laughs> but they did. Uh, and I flew the T-2 Buckeye. Uh, Initially, the A version of a T-2A, which was a single engine uh, jet with two seats, a front seat and a back seat, and the back mm -hmm. seat was for the instructor. The student pilot always sat in the front seat. And we learned uh, how to operate jet uh, aircraft as opposed to propeller airplanes. And we learned uh, some basic navigation and uh, some formation flying, things like that. And then we graduated from that into uh, a two-seat, a, a two-engine version of the T2. It was called the T2B. Still a front seat and a back seat. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned some more advanced navigation things. And then we went to the T2C, another two-engine, but this one we specifically went out to the aircraft carrier. Every individual that wears a set of gold naval aviator wings has to have proven his ability to land an airplane on an aircraft carrier. And take off? And take off. So you did get to experience what your father had. That's right. Mm -hmm. I did. In fact, much later in my Marine Corps career, I got to again for real in, a, in another airplane I'll tell you about in a little bit. So... Um, we went back down from Meridian, we went back down to Pensacola and we started doing what they call FCLPs, Field Carrier Landing Practice. So we're pretending to land on an aircraft carrier, but mm -hmm. 
but that aircraft carrier deck is drawn onto the asphalt runway on land. Okay. All right, and they had an LSO, which is called a landing signal officer, and that LSO would help us fly the correct glide slope down to land in a mm -hmm. specific spot. Uh, because on an aircraft carrier, it's obviously a very small landing area, right? Because it's a ship. Mm -hmm. It's not a big runway, it's just a ship floating mm -hmm. out in the water. Um, and so it's critical to land in the right spot. They have arresting cables, arresting gear cables, mm -hmm. that the hook on our airplane has to catch. And if you don't land in the exact right spot and at the exact right angle of descent, that hook will not catch those wires. So you have to get really good at this stuff. And so they trained us to do that. And then they sent us out to prove that we could do it. I'm going to interject very quickly because my experience with this, so limited, extremely limited, not really non-existent, but at the recent Culpeper Air Fest mm -hmm. as part of the media, um, the pre-media program, uh, I got to ride in one of those T6 Texans. Yeah. So uh, I mean, you were talking about these seats, I'm sure it's similar. And again, the two-seater thing in the back, and of course I'm just sitting there riding, pilots doing everything. But Anyway, fantastic experience. So as I'm listening to this, I'm, you know, relating to, I mean, it's just an exhilarating feeling. Flying is so close to heaven. I love it. Anyway, yeah. sorry. Had to interject because you're talking about that. Well, I know how you feel. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've felt that same exhilaration. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've also flown the T-6 uh, airplane, mm -hmm. so I know exactly how you feel. Well, so we proved that we could land a jet on an aircraft carrier, and so that finished up our basic... Uh, jet training, then they needed to send us to advanced jet training. And uh, the bases, the naval bases that conducted that training were in Texas. One of them was in Corpus Christi and the other one was in Beeville, Texas. And I got assigned to Beeville. Beeville. <laughs> Beeville, Texas. Nobody had ever heard of Beeville, Texas. Okay, just in terms of uh, geography, is that in the southern part of Texas? Well, of course, or Corpus Christi obviously mm -hmm. is right there on the Gulf. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Beeville is probably an hour, hour and a half drive north, north. before you get to San okay. Antonio. Okay, okay. All right. But it's way out in flatland Texas. And the jet that we were uh, using in Beeville was called the F-9J Cougar. That's an old Korean War fighter, right, that they had modified a little bit mm -hmm. to make it a, a student trainer, a jet trainer. Uh, all of us wanted to fly the TA-4 Skyhawk. It was a much newer airplane and uh, an easier airplane to fly because its engine was more responsive. Um, I don't want to get into mm -hmm. too many details about engine and thermodynamics mm -hmm. and so forth to tell you why, but it was much easier to fly than the F-9 was to bring it aboard ship. Okay, So we all wanted to fly the TA-4, but that was only down near Corpus Christi in a place mm -hmm. called Kingsville, Texas. But I got orders to Beeville, Texas. Beeville. Okay. okay. And so I flew the F-9, and looking back on it, I'm kind of glad I did. It was kind of a neat airplane. And we learned uh, not only all the advanced uh, aspects of all the earlier knowledge that we had gained, but we started learning uh, weapons delivery and uh, air combat maneuvering, dogfighting, mm -hmm. uh, uh, type, uh, and mm -hmm. formation. So we got really good at formation flying. You've seen the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds and you see what they do. Well, I'm here to tell you that every Marine Corps and Naval uh, jet pilot is every bit as good as those Blue Angels. They fly just as closely, they do all the same maneuvers. Well, even on this thing that I went with on that T-6 Texan, there were four of us mm -hmm. and they were flying in formation. How they do that, I mean, you know how they do that, but that is a beautiful thing. And you're probably somewhat scared a little bit because of how close you are. Yeah, you're just you're not used to being that close. Mm -hmm. Well, you just, you do. You get used to it. After several times, you start getting used to it. So we learned a lot more about uh, formation flying. And at the end of the advanced jet training program, for me, in November of 71, then uh, we got our wings. 
I had one small hiccup, though. Uh, remember I told you we had to show that we could land on an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. I in thought the, you'd done that. In the T2C, well, mm -hmm. we had to show it again in the F9 in advanced training. We had to go back out to the USS Lexington, which was our training uh, carrier, mm -hmm. uh, and land there. And it's a sort of a long story, but I'll just tell you that I crashed on the ship. Uh, when I, as soon as my airplane touched down, the left main landing gear collapsed. And so, so that the, wasn't really your fault, was Well, it? they, the squadron commander would like to not have that blemish on mm. his safety record, so he would rather think that it was my fault. Um, and my rate of descent at the time that I touched down might have been a little higher than it should have been. But the first thing that happened was the wheel came off the landing gear and went mm -hmm. right towards the, remember I said the LSO, the landing signal mm -hmm. officer, there's usually four or five of those guys standing on a little platform on the side of the ship helping talk you down. Uh, the wheel came off and went right by their platform and into the water, into the Gulf of Mexico. I was afraid you were gonna tell me you took one of them out. No, I, <laughs> thankfully I did not take one of them out. Okay. And so uh, as that wheel came off and the landing gear settled down onto its axle, that's when the landing gear collapsed. And now the airplane settled down completely onto its wing. Well, mm -hmm. thankfully I had caught, my hook had caught one of the wires, but with all that drag on my left wing and being slowed down by the arresting cable, it drug me over to the port side, which is the left side of the ship and then hung me over the edge of the ship. So I'm sitting there in my ejection seat, uh, what, you know, 60 feet above the ocean, watching the water go by, wondering, uh, well, the first thought I had was how much trouble I was gonna be in, and the second thought I was, had was, uh, maybe I should get out of this airplane before it actually falls over the side. So I was going I'm to... I'm picturing this yeah, and wondering how you get out of this. There's a lever in the cockpit of the airplane that I could have pulled and jettisoned the canopy. But on that, that particular airplane, the F9J Cougar, if you jettison the canopy, it slides back uh, very rapidly and just shears off the tail of the airplane. And then the ejection seat would come out. Well, I thought about jettisoning the canopy, but then in the rear view mirrors that we have in those airplanes, I could see a lot of the Navy guys crawling over the back of the airplane to get to me, to save me before I fell in the water, okay? So I thought about it for a second and decided not to jettison the canopy. Instead, I just opened it normally, electrically, on back it would go. And then I unbuckled and mm -hmm. I crawled up the back of the airplane. They grabbed onto me and they helped me get back onto the flight deck. And the plane? And the, well, the plane, they, were, they brought what they call a cherry picker. It's kind of like a little crane they have mm -hmm. on board the ship. And it came over and grabbed onto the airplane, picked it up and put it on the flight deck again. Okay. So they didn't lose the airplane. Um, but they were pretty angry with me because uh, I had just disrupted the whole operation, <laughs> obviously. Uh, and I still had to, uh, to, I had more landings to do mm -hmm. on the ship. I wasn't yet qualified. So they sat me in the ready room down in one of the decks of the aircraft carrier and forced me to uh, look at the replay of my crash landing uh, several times. And then they called my name, told me to man up a certain airplane on the hangar deck. So I went out there, I found the airplane, I got in and I strapped in and sat there for what seemed like an hour or so, it may have been only a half an hour, 45 minutes. And then all of a sudden airplanes got moved out of my way and they towed my airplane out onto one of the elevators on the aircraft carrier, lifted me up on the elevator, put me back on the catapult and shot me off again. <clears throat> they said, now don't mess up again. It's like falling off a horse. <laughs> yeah, Get that's back right. on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I didn't mess up again, although I wasn't really, uh, I was kind of bothered about that quite a bit. I came around and I did all the landings I was supposed to do and I was okay after that. Uh, they convened an accident board and they thought about not letting me, not allowing me to uh, receive my gold wings because I had crashed on a ship. But I had actually qualified so they went ahead and let me get my gold wings. All right.
And then I went off to the Marine Corps to fly real airplanes for a real purpose. All right, so now we're at, we're right around 71, going into 72. November 71, mm -hmm. and I joined my first squadron in February of 72. And that was VMFA-212. VMFA, uh, the V stands for fixed wing, <clears throat> as opposed to a helicopter squadron that would start with an H. The V stood for a fixed wing squadron, M for Marines, F for fighter, A for attack. So it was a Marine, fixed wing squadron, fighter attack. All right. And we flew F-4 Phantoms. I flew my first uh, flight in the F-4 Phantom, uh, I think it was in that February of that year. Uh, and your first flight in that brand new Mach 2 airplane is you're, you're by yourself. You're the only guy that has control of the airplane. The Rio radar intercept officer in the backseat, he has no control. He's not. He, oh, okay, so he doesn't have anything No to throttles, do no rudder pedals, no stick. He, he can only control the radar, and he can talk on the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was no big deal. I mean, uh, an airplane is an airplane. They all fly. Uh, this one was a particularly fast airplane, this F-4 Phantom. So when I lit both afterburners, it was a real kick in the pants uh, to accelerate that quickly. So where were you assigned then? Where are you That was now? at Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. That was my first squadron. And like I say, I had about eight hours, and then the Tet Offensive in Vietnam happened, and uh, the National Command Authority said we need a Marine squadron. The first available was right there in Hawaii, so the uh, brigade general uh, decided to send my squadron, VMFA-212, in, and I got put over in the other squadron, VMFA-235. Right. There was one other fella, a new guy, a nugget, nugget. <clears throat> with me, that became a far more famous than I did. His name was Jim Amos, James F. Amos, the 35th Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. First time in history that they had chosen a naval aviator, a pilot, to be the Commandant of the Marine Corps. It's always been a ground pounder, mm -hmm. you know. But in the Marine Corps, uh, you've probably heard this before, first and foremost, every Marine, whether he's a four-star general, or a PFC is a rifleman, okay? And that's what is so great about the Marine Corps. We're a completely, totally organic organization. We can go into a combat theater and uh, sustain ourselves. We have an air component, we have a logistics component, we have artillery, we have everything that we need uh, to be self-sustaining. Uh, however, Throughout history, since 1775, when the Marine Corps mm -hmm. started, uh, the Commandant, the, the head guy of the Marine Corps, a four-star general, has always been a, uh, a ground officer. And for the first time, my squadron mate, Jim Amos, his call sign was Tamer. Oh, that's another thing oh, that I was, need to yeah, tell you. Okay. We all have our own call signs. And we don't choose our own classes. I was wondering, I thought you got, <clears throat> that maybe you got to make those up or something. No, uh, we probably all had ideas of what we'd like to be called, usually macho things like no. <laughs> eagle or, you know, something like that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I don't know really why Jim Amos got the call sign Tamer, T-A-M-E-R, but that's what his call sign was. Uh, I was given the call sign of easy. And it wasn't because, it's usually because of something you've done. And it's usually something you did wrong. Uh, and so in order to badger you and kid you for the rest of your life, they give you this call sign. Uh, in my case, we had another pilot in the squadron. His name, first name was Ed. And they called him Easy Ed, all right? And uh, he got orders to leave, and so now the squadron was without an Easy. But there was this other Nugget friend of mine in the squadron, a fellow named Howard Plagens. And it was, this was the time, the era of uh, Laugh-In, and they had the mm -hmm. Uncle Al, the Kitty's Pal mm -hmm. on Laugh-In. So every time he would see me, he would say, Uncle Al, the kitty's pal, 
okay? And then when they didn't have Easy Ed any longer, because he had left, they decided, well, we'll just give it to Al. So instead of Uncle Al, he'll be Easy Al. So all of my name tags and all of my flight suits and stuff, they all have my call sign uh, typed on there, just Easy, E-A-S-Y. I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a friend that had a call sign, I forget what it was before, but he was out flying an F-18 uh, out of El Toro, California one day, and there the oxygen system that we have in these airplanes is a liquid oxygen system. That's extremely cold, we're in the minus mm -hmm. several hundred degrees, and it's in a bottle, it's a, it's a cryogenic bottle, and there's a regulator and, uh, and there's something that turns it back into gaseous oxygen and goes up through a hose into our oxygen mask, okay? Well, something failed in it and, and it broke down here and 100% uh, pure liquid oxygen went all over the left side of his thigh right here. What did that and do? And froze his skin for several inches deep. Oh, jeez! Okay, it froze his muscles. All right, somehow or other, I don't know how he did it, but he was able to make it back and safely land the airplane. We had to get him out of the cockpit. We took him to the hospital. He spent months in the hospital, and it was extremely torturous because they had to clean that thing like every hour or something oh like this my. as it was healing. Well, so whatever his call sign was before, I don't know, but from that day on, his call sign was Frosty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so that gives you the, an idea of the mentality of this close group of pilots, uh, friends who live and die together. You know, that's something else I was going to ask you too, because when you go through this training, uh, you, uh, friendships and things I'm sure are formed. <clears throat> are are, are the, some of those friendships maintained? Yeah, or? Uh, yeah. It's. Uh, even when you're not being shot at in this kind of business, this aviation business, uh, it's extremely uh, risky, unforgiving of mistakes, okay, flying these airplanes. Uh, there's uh, millions of parts, the failure of one of which could be disastrous for your day. So just getting into one of these airplanes is dangerous on its own. And we always fly in uh, formations of two or more. We never go out alone mm -hmm. into combat. So we're always uh, training together um, so we become very close. Uh, so we have some very good friends. And, and I've been in a lot of squadrons in a lot of different places in the country. And I've gone with those squadrons to a lot of different places in the world. And uh, we're those friends that you have in those squadrons. And I've lost some of those friends. Because mm -hmm. I, like I say, it's a dangerous world. So there's, even in peacetime, there's aircraft accidents. Something fails on the airplane and one or both of the crew mm -hmm. members uh, don't survive. Well now when you talk about uh, some of the friends and what not surviving, uh, so, uh, in your experience with these planes, now did you actually go into any of the war zones or? or well, uh, like I say, with that Tet Offensive in mm -hmm. April of 72, I didn't get to go with that squadron, so right. I had missed that. And then mm -hmm. right after that, Vietnam was over. Okay. The, the war, our participation in it uh, ended. Uh, and so it wasn't until years later when I was a major and I was in a completely different squadron with a completely different airplane and I was aboard ship mm -hmm. now uh, that I got to um, be involved in the uh, strike that we ran against Libya in 1986. Oh, wow. So okay. I was on that strike. That was my only claim to fame in the Marine Corps. Well, but I mean, that's a, a great claim to fame. How, <clears throat> how long were you involved in that in 86? Well, that strike was a, a one-shot deal. It lasted mm -hmm. about two hours. Uh, we had several aircraft carriers involved, and of course we had even the Air Force was mm -hmm. involved in, with their F-111s that had launched out of England and flew eight hours all the way across from England to Libya to drop their bombs and then return. Uh, we had several aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean mm -hmm. uh, near the Gulf of Sidra, Muammar mm -hmm. Gaddafi's Gulf of Sidra. Uh, 
our job from the USS Coral Sea was against the Benghazi area. And you know all about Benghazi sure. now, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, our job then was to destroy uh, the airfield at Benghazi and several of the terrorist base camps that Gaddafi was running uh, in Libya, and we did that job uh, nearly 100%. Mm -hmm. We destroyed them. Okay, and the Air Force, their job was to go uh, to Tripoli and do a number of things like that in addition uh, to taking out Muammar Gaddafi himself. And they got pretty close. And they were dropping very large uh, weapons uh, in order to try to get him. So, so when you took off for, uh, to, to do that, where were you flying from when you went over to Libya? Well, we were just outside of the line of death. Mm -hmm. If you uh, look at the map of northern Africa where Libya is, you see how it dips down into this thing called the Gulf of Sidra that uh, Gaddafi claimed to uh, belong to him, to belong to Libya. And he had that line of death, that straight line that went mm -hmm. across the top. And we were always flying inside of that for uh, the six months that we were operating in the Mediterranean, we would take off from the aircraft carrier, loaded to the gills, ready to shoot anybody that uh, got in our way, and we would fly into the uh, airspace over the Gulf of Sidra, well beyond the line of death, and they would launch their airplanes out after us, and we would end up intercepting their airplanes and flying formation on them, and we had a uh, what's called the Rules of Engagement, the ROE. Okay, and the rules of engagement said that we were not allowed to fire on anybody, Libyan or otherwise, unless we were fired. Well, it was, it was meant to be unless we were fired on first. But the words that we used were unless something came off of their airplane. Well, we had one Navy fella who was out there flying his F-18 uh, with his wingman. And uh, apparently whatever it was that he did in maneuvering against the Libyan aircraft kind of scared the Libyan pilot. And so mm -hmm. the Libyan pilot jettisoned his fuel tanks. Well, that's all it took. Now, uh, Fryer was his call sign. When Fryer saw the fuel tanks, he thought, okay, the rules of engagement say unless something comes off of his airplane first and the <laughs> fuel tank come off, mm -hmm. so I, I can shoot the guy. So he called back to uh, our controllers on the ship and said something came off his airplane and well, they said, now Fryer, you, you, fuel tanks don't count. <laughs> so Fryer didn't get to shoot down the Libyan airplane like he wanted to. Uh, I did uh, one uh, evening, uh, I intercepted a Libyan airplane. It was in the, uh, in the clouds actually so we hadn't identified it, but the ship had seen that it was coming out towards the ship, and that's mm -hmm. a no-no. You don't, uh, especially if you're in a uh, potential combat scenario, the a U.S. aircraft carrier, uh, a battle group, is not going to allow an enemy aircraft to get anywhere near it. That's what our job is with our airplanes, is to make sure that nobody gets near that ship. Uh, and so I was vectored which means sent out on a direction mm -hmm. uh, towards that Libyan aircraft that was coming from Libya. Uh, and I had to intercept it while it was in the clouds. So I used my radar to intercept it and get real close enough until I could identify it. As it turns out, it was a Boeing 727 commercial airliner, a, a Libyan commercial airliner. But I was all armed and ready to pull the trigger to shoot it down uh, when I saw that it was an airliner. So I disarmed. I put the, the armament switch in the off position. Oh, that was good. <laughs> yeah, so I wouldn't accidentally shoot a... The USS Coral Sea uh, was originally designed as a battleship. So it had the, the hull design of a battleship. And the keel for that battleship was laid in uh, sometime early in 1941. Well, what happened in December of 41? Pearl Harbor. What did we need immediately thereafter? Aircraft carriers, okay? So they finished off the uh, ship, not as a battleship, but as a flat top aircraft carrier. And back in those days, remember that the um, flight decks of these aircraft carriers were all straight flight decks, all right? Uh, and the airplanes that they were 
using on those uh, were propeller driven airplanes, relatively slow, uh, and airplanes that could take off, had high lift wings that could take off in a shorter distance than a jet could. Because jets are fast, so they got tiny little wings with less drag. These other propeller driven mm -hmm. airplanes had big wings, okay? So they could have a stack of airplanes in the front and a stack of airplanes in the back, and the ones in the front could take off from the middle of the ship off the front and get airborne just fine, and then they move all the other ones up and be ready to launch them as the other ones were coming back in on the back, all right? Well, somebody got the brilliant idea of angling the flight deck on these aircraft carriers, uh, probably sometime around the 1950s, late 50s. And so instead of a straight deck like this, they put a section of it towards the back of it that was angled off like this, all right? So airplanes that were launching were launching off the front and airplanes that were landing could be landing at the same time, right here on this angle and not run into these airplanes if you're the really good. If, if they're really good. And believe me, <laughs> these guys. Now, I was a Marine, see, so I was flying with a bunch of Navy guys that do this for a living. Right? I'm just trying to survive landing on the ship because I'd flown most of my airplanes. I even crashed during training uh, on a ship. So I volunteered to go on the Coral Sea mostly so that I could prove myself that I really can do this. Prove it to myself, actually. Um, but these Navy guys, they're very good. And the precision that this whole operation uh, has is, is just mind-boggling. Um, when you're in an area where there's a potential threat, you don't want to advertise where you are, where mm. you're going, what you're going to do, and when you're going to do it. You don't advertise that stuff, okay? So we had daily changing uh, flight cards full of information. Uh, there's this uh, thing called marshalling. When you're, when a, a 30 airplanes that have already launched off the airplane, they've been out doing their mission, they're gonna come back and all of them are gonna try to land on the ship. They have to first of all find the ship because the ship's been moving while they were off playing their war games. The ship's been moving. So they gotta know where the ship is and they have to know where to find it and what direction to uh, travel uh, to get to it, okay? And this could be, you know, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. This is dark out over the Mediterranean Sea. So you're gonna, and there's boats on the Mediterranean Sea, but they all have lights on it. And so it looks like stars. So you don't really know what's up or down. Well, that's an interesting perspective, yeah. Yeah, it looks all the same. Well, uh, so we had these cards that would have information on it that they'd give us before we launched. And then uh, at the end of the mission, we'd head off in a direction and we'd say one thing over the radio uh, and we'd get a call back and it would say something like uh, Delta 241. So we'd look on our card, Delta is a, s a set of latitude and longitude positions uh, and uh, so we'd go to that latitude and longitude position. Uh, in that uh, radio call, there would also be altitude information and time. So we'd go to that point. We know that 241 is the uh, compass heading that we would fly from that point in a descent. And at the end of the descent, there would be the ship. Okay? We don't say a thing to anybody. Nobody talks. So, uh, so the bad guys can't uh, intercept what it is that we're saying and find out where we are just because of our radio signals. Uh, we'd, be, we'd go to that latitude and longitude at the assigned altitude, which is, and there are 30 of us getting back to that one spot in the sky. And so we had to be stacked altitude wise every 100 or 200 feet. So we're a, a beehive of airplanes with 100 to 200 feet of altitude separation in the same point in the sky and our time, our Charlie time, was the time that we would push over from that latitude and longitude. So we would just go into a holding pattern at that one point in, in the sky, and we had to range our circle in that uh, holding pattern such that we pushed off at that time, at the assigned time, within plus or minus three seconds. 
right? And we're traveling at, you know, in this particular time, probably 250 to 300 knots, like miles per hour. And we have to arrange that circle so that if my assigned time was 1122 uh, and 30 seconds, I had to push over at 1132 and 27 seconds to 33 seconds. That's when I had to push over. And you're not talking to each other. We're not talking, that's not saying a thing to each other. That's when you go to training. Okay, so now we're in like the uh, mid 80s. I think you said 86. 86 is when that happened. There was a, uh, several different squadrons, F4 squadrons that I had been in in the meantime before that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, also, I uh, after my third F4 squadron, which was VMFA 232, the Red Devils, and that mm -hmm. was in my first overseas deployment. When I left overseas, I came back to the States, uh, I was a flight instructor in Beeville, Texas. So I had been a student Did you there. you request Beeville? No, I didn't, I didn't request being a flight instructor, to be honest with you, but that's what the assignment was. So I went from flying uh, the F-4 Phantom operationally after my third squadron of doing that, then I went back to uh, Beeville, and by now they had gotten rid of all those old Korean fighters, mm -hmm. the F-9 Cougars, and uh, they had the TA-4Js, which is what I had wanted to fly uh, as a student. So now I'm an instructor in the TA-4J, and I spent uh, about two and a half years there, and uh, they made me the formation standardization officer, and uh, I was uh, one of the um, ACM, or Air mm -hmm. Combat Maneuvering Dogfight Instructors. Uh, and then at the end of that period of time, and we flew a lot. I flew more flight time in that two and a half uh, years mm -hmm. than I had in the previous six some odd years in the F-4. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we were flying three or four flights per day to crank out the students, get them graduated mm -hmm. back into the fleet, right? Uh, but then I got uh, orders to Amphibious Warfare School. Uh, that's also in Quantico, Virginia. That's just one of those checks in the block that you have to do with the Marine Corps to advance to higher and higher uh, ranks. So I went to Amphibious Warfare School. That was an 11 month school here in Quantico. And then I finally got what I really wanted to do in the Marine Corps and I got assigned to the Navy's test pilot school. So I went from Quantico, Virginia, down to Patuxent River, Maryland, which is where the Navy's test pilot school was. And that was another 11-month school, very intense, uh, three primary areas of intensity, uh, one of which is academics. Mm -hmm. uh, the other is flight techniques, testing techniques. And the third is report writing, because when a test pilot tests an airplane, he has to communicate those test results to somebody that can do something about, mm -hmm. to, which would be the engineers at the company that makes the airplane, okay? And you have to speak their language. Well, I got my degree in aeronautical engineering. So, so I, there you go. I had a leg up <laughs> on all this, right? So I, I didn't have any problem with the academics because I had all that math already before. Uh, and I was a, uh, a good enough, uh, we call them the stick, a good enough pilot that I could uh, gather uh, worthwhile data instead of sloppy data. I could get good data that the engineers could actually use. Uh, and uh, my, the hardest part for me was the actual writing. You have to write in a certain way in order to communicate this information back to the engineers. But I got good enough at that. Uh, and so I graduated uh, from the Navy's test pilot school, and at that exact moment, the brand spanky new FA-18 Hornet, being built by uh, McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis, Missouri, had just arrived. All we had was, I think, three of them at the time. They were brand new prototypes, okay? So did you get to... And so I, get to, I got oh. to start flying those. Now we have uh, test pilots in the military have uh, three kinds of jobs. There's uh, an experimental test pilot, there's an engineering test pilot, and then there's a production test pilot. The experimental test pilot is the kind of guy that would fly an airplane for the very first time ever, okay? 
or if they stuck something new, if they changed mm -hmm. the shape of the wing and somebody had to fly it, that would be an experimental test pilot. But now if, uh, if the uh, military pilots needed to verify what the company test pilots had been doing, then they would go out, they're called engineering test pilots. So they understand all the same things that the experimental guys are doing, but the experimental guys, experimental guys have already flown those flights, mm -hmm. right? So you go out and do it again, you verify it. The experimental test pilots expand the operational envelope of an airplane, and the engineering test pilots verify that expansion. And then there's the production test mm -hmm. pilot who, now that the airplane's been in service for several years, they're, they're producing more and more of them. He takes them out for the first flight out of the factory. We already know how it's going to act. So the production test pilot... So when you were... So which one were you? I was an engineering test pilot. Engineering, okay. That's right. So after the company test pilots uh, flew it and, uh, and, and told us that it flies okay, then we would go out and we would verify that they were telling the truth. Because we're spending billions of dollars on these airplanes. On an airplane program like the F-18, it was like a $30 billion uh, lifespan program. Yeah, a lot of responsibility, lot for of sure. responsibility, yeah. So now we're getting close to the early 90s. So how long did you stay in before you uh, retired? Well, I was... Uh, you, you, you're not allowed to retire on any day other than the first of a month, okay? And you can't retire earlier than the 20 years. So since I got my commission on June 6th, I had to wait until July 1st. So I was actually in for 20 years and 24 days. Okay. Right. And, and then th I retired. Then you retired. And then I know after that, uh, how soon did you get into American Airlines? Uh, I had my um, acceptance to American Airlines and my job offer and my training date already before uh, the day I retired from the Marines. Mm -hmm. And that was for a month or so later. So I retired on the 1st of July and sometime in August, I drove to Dallas to start training with American Airlines. You know, I, I, it would be interesting sometime to know how many of the commercial airline pilots have got former military background. About 75%. About 75%. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about that. And that was something uh, very important because after 9-11, we decided uh, maybe the pilots should be armed to help prevent. And I know you were a proponent of that. Uh, so prior to the uh, mid-60s, pilots had to be armed. Uh, and then that uh, law got changed. They didn't have to be armed anymore, but it didn't say they couldn't be armed anymore. So a lot of pilots continued to carry a weapon in their flight bag or something like that just in case they needed it. And a few times it had been used to uh, prevent uh, hijackings and things like that th through our history. And then I think it was 1983, there was an event uh, out in California, I forget the name of the airline, uh, Pacific Airways or something like that, a disgruntled ground crew member from one of the airlines had uh, gotten on, but remember back in those days they didn't make us go through the kind of security mm -hmm. that they do now. So this guy got on the airplane and shot uh, both pilots and the airplane crashed and killed all the people. All right. So then Congress came out and passed a law that now the pilots had to go through uh, the metal detectors to make sure that they weren't armed. And from that day forward, none of the pilots were armed. Okay, just like mm -hmm. the, supposedly none of the passengers, right? Uh, but we had had no problems with pilots indiscriminately shooting people in, you know, prior to the mid 60s. And they were all armed because they had to be, because they carried mail. We tried to tell them that. They asked us some really stupid questions. You know, I was, uh, I spent a lot of time on Fox and Friends and CNN and stuff mm -hmm. like this when we were getting interviewed, when we were trying to get this program going. And they asked me really dumb questions like, aren't I afraid I'm gonna, I'll shoot the windows out of the cockpit? And I'm looking at them and said, but Gretchen, I'm not gonna be shooting in that direction. I mean, what terrorists are going to be coming in through the front window when we're flying along at 500 miles an hour? 
All right, they're coming from behind us through that door. So no, I'm not going to shoot out those windows. How bad of a shot do you think I am? You know, uh, they were worried that we would uh, blow a hole if we would shoot, maybe either go through the bad guy or miss the bad guy and put a hole in the airplane, and all the people on the airplane would get sucked out through that hole because they had seen what whatever that uh, 007 movie right. was where supposedly that happened. And we had to explain the engineering impossibility. And then, of, of course, that. there's also the possibility that you could shoot a passenger, I suppose. But we, pro we could, but remember, that's a very small door. And the only reason we would be shooting somebody is because they're not supposed to be coming through that door. If they're coming through that door uh, when they're not supposed to, then I'm going to stop them from coming through that door because the primary concern for the two pilots who are responsible for the safe operation of that airplane is maintaining control of the airplane. And that's what happened on 9-11. Mm -hmm. All right, we put these, uh, the next thing they said is, well, you're going to put these uh, uh, bulletproof, uh, tamper-proof doors in place, the hardened doors, right? Well, we have people in this country that are experts at getting through doors like that. Okay, so I suppose that other countries and other organizations have experts on getting through doors like that as well. So you could put that door up there, and I think it's a good idea. At least it'll slow them down. But it doesn't mean they're not going to get through. And rather than you sending an F-16 up to shoot the airplane down and kill everybody on the airplane, why don't you give us guns so we can shoot the bad guys so that before they take control of the airplane? And when you say armed, what are we talking about? A 38, a 45? Is there some flexibility in there? Or? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you that they, they are semi-automatic weapons. They're not revolvers. Uh, I won't, I can't no, tell you the caliber, but uh, uh, we have the tools now that we need uh, to stop somebody or a number of people coming through the cockpit, uh, through that door. Uh, one of the other arguments they tried to use against us is that uh, we would be up there flying and playing with our new toys. <laughs> they were showing each other, hey, what's your gun like? What's my gun like? You know, like as if we did any of that stuff. We have an axe and, and we also have a fire extinguisher. We could be playing with that, but we're not. So what makes you think we're going to be playing with our guns? 9-11 happened and of course the airspace shut down. We didn't have any airplanes in the sky for four days after 9-11. And I was on uh, the first airplane allowed to fly after the skies started to open up a little bit out of Washington, D.C. on my way to Dallas for our first board of directors meeting with the, I just happened to be chairman of the Washington pilots at that time when, when all this happened. And so uh, I'm chairman of about 500 pilots, and a friend of mine uh, who was the chairman of the Dallas pilots, he had 3,000 pilots, because a lot of American Airlines pilots in Dallas. He made the motion that we set as a goal the arming of all pilots for uh, any of America's airlines, which would include United, American, Delta, mm -hmm. US Air, all of the airplanes all of the airlines and I'm the one that seconded that motion. So they made us in charge of a committee called the Committee for the Armed Defense of the Cockpit, CADC. All right. And uh, it took us a couple of years. Um, we were able to get Congress to, in the uh, National Transportation uh, Safety Act of 2001, right after 9-11, we were able to get Congress to say that the Department of Transportation could develop an armed pilot program, but it didn't mandate to them. Norm Mineta was the Secretary of Transportation mm -hmm. at the time, and he refused to do it. So we had to go back to the drawing board and get Congress to this time mandate to the Department of Transportation that they must, within the next 90 days, you must uh, 
develop and start a program for arming the pilots of all America's airlines. And that's what we did. So now they are? All of them are. are well, no, I, 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 that's incorrect mm. to say that. I can't tell you mm. how many there are, not because I don't know, but mm. because you can't know. Okay. Others can't know. But uh, it's, it, uh, it's in the tens of thousands. And we have uh, roughly 100,000 commercial airline pilots in this country. Uh, we fly 30,000 flights, scheduled flights per day in this country. In this country, not in the world, in, the, in this country alone. So you can see that in order to cover uh, airlines with that level of security, you would have to have many thousands of pilots. We, we thought, and this is getting back to the fact that we have 75% or retire or former military mm -hmm. people, uh, we tried to convince uh, the administration that uh, we're already trained in weapons. We're from the military, whether we be Marines or Navy or mm -hmm. Army or whatever. Uh, so it's not really that big a deal to allow the pilots uh, to have weapons in the cockpit in case somebody wants to try to pull another 9-11 scenario. Uh, and what we wanted the program to be was a deterrent against somebody thinking that they might want to do this. Because in that world of thinking, they don't want to fail. Because whoever it is that they believe in doesn't look fondly upon them when they fail. So if they try to do something and they fail, it's almost worse than if they didn't try it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So we tried to deter them from even trying it by convincing them that if they did, they would fail. And the only way we could do that was to have a very robust program with many pilots so that the likelihood of them uh, trying a 9-11 scenario on any airplane would probably be met with failure. It was just all a matter of probability because we didn't really want to shoot anybody. We just wanted nobody to try it. We wanted sure. them to think we would shoot them. So now American Airlines, how long were you with them? And then you, uh, I know you're retired from that now. I did. I, I tried to do 20 years with them, but I only got 16 okay. uh, out of it. And uh, at that time, the, fe the um, Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, had a rule that uh, an airline pilot had to retire when he was 60 years old. And uh, I was 58, and I was getting, this is after 9-11 now, right? I'd gone through that not just as a pilot, but as the chairman of this group of mm -hmm. 500 pilots here in uh, Washington, D.C. And I was getting very tired of the new security procedures. It was an extreme, well, you know, as, as uh, passengers, mm -hmm. what you have to go through just to get on an airplane. Of course, we had to do it, you know, couple of times a week uh, and I just had had enough so I went into the chief pilot and I said I think I've had enough I'm going to save you several thousand dollars you don't have to send me to training again because I quit <laughs> so I retired when I was 58 after 16 years with American wow really it's it's interesting how it's all connected your experience in the military and then with the airlines and right. then that and now I know that you're very proactive uh, on the local political scene and other things that you uh, stay very active with. Um, I'm just wondering your overall uh, military experience and this other, what kind of, I mean, if you could leave some kind of message for young people coming up in terms of military service or attitude toward protecting the country. Well, I'm glad you said protecting the uh, country because that's really what it's all about. What protects our individual liberties is what the founders gave us, and it's called the Constitution, right? And that Constitution isn't just a bunch of words on four pieces of paper. Uh, a lot of thought went into that by some brilliant people. Uh, there's principles behind how they uh, arranged the uh, uh, 
branches of government and how they're dependent upon each other and how there are separation of powers and how there's checks and balances, federalism and so forth. And uh, the advice I would have to young people is to learn that, understand that, and protect that. That's what we did in the military. You know, we took an oath. Every time that I uh, was promoted from lieutenant to captain, captain to major, major to lieutenant colonel, so I raised my hand, I repeated the oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. I'm not protecting the President of the United States. I'm not protecting the people's freedom, although indirectly mm -hmm. I am. What I'm doing is I'm preserving that Constitution. Those words on that paper is what guarantees your liberty. All right. Well, as we wrap up this uh, interview, is there anything that we've left out? Anything you'd like to add? Uh, not really. Uh, it sounded as if it was all work, 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 but uh, as you'll see in some of the photographs that uh, I've given you, that uh, we uh, we had a good time. So I wouldn't have, I wouldn't change a thing. I really wouldn't. Uh, we played hard. We played at least as hard as we worked. <laughs> okay, you would think so with the yes. United States Marines, right? Yes. <laughs> we played very hard. Uh, we had an annual affair. The uh, Marine Corps started uh, on November 10th, 1775, the Continental Congress. We didn't even have a constitution yet. The Continental Congress said there will be two battalions of Marines. And where do you think they went to find the first Marines? I don't know. They went to a bar okay. <laughs> in Philadelphia <laughs> called Tun Tavern. So on November 10th, 1775, in a bar called Tun Tavern in Philadelphia, the Marine Corps started. Uh, so we celebrate our birthday on the 10th of November 10th every of November. year, and it's a big, huge deal. And it, really, and it coincides with uh, Veterans Day, too. It does, is, mm -hmm. and it also coincides with my uh, daughter's birthday, which is November 11th. Oh, well, there you go. All right. <clears throat> and so her, her middle name is Maureen. <laughs> It's actually M-A-U-R-I-N-E, uh, so it's Maureen instead of Maureen, but she oh, kids me that uh, she was born the day after the... In fact, my wife was in labor with her in Hawaii during the Marine Corps birthday ball on November 10th. <laughs> I took her from the ball to the hospital. To the <laughs> hospital. Well, thank you so much, Al, for joining us today. This has been very uh, enlightening and inspirational. Um, look forward to more of these veteran interviews in this partnership with Culpeper Times and Culpeper Media Network. Mm -hmm.